All right, we're celebrating Rob DeLuca, the amazing run of his band Spread Eagle, bassist, songwriter, producer. Um, Rob, it's been a been an incredible run here, starting with the self titled album. Um, being, you know, from the Northeast, how did the band originally come together, and what was your common influences or vision? Well. We are all guys from the Northeast. Ray was from Brooklyn. I was from Wilmington, Delaware. Paul DiBartolo was from, um, I think, Morristown or, or Morris Plains, New Jersey, somewhere around there. And Tommy Gallo was from Plymouth, Massachusetts. And uh, I moved up, Paul and I, separately moved up to Boston to go to school at Berkeley College of Music. And Paul, um, who was a little older than I, started putting bands together, playing out in the clubs. And I started, I arrived on the scene and started going to the metal clubs. And I saw Paul's band and uh, he asked me to join and what we just couldn't succeed uh, cause we didn't have the right chemistry. And then we moved to New York, got Ray and got signed within, um, a couple months. Wow. Uh, cause we had put in a lot of work before Ray and the three of us had our shit together, but we just didn't have the right front man. And Ray was obviously the right front man. So it came together, um, uh, very quickly. And to ask, to answer about what, what our vision was, we yeah. heard what was coming out of Hollywood and the Sunset Strip, and we felt it did not represent us at all. Um, we thought it, but some of those bands were very cool, but it didn't speak for us. So we decided to blend our influences um, with, you know, with some of that influence, some of what was coming out of Hollywood and make uh, our own sound. And, uh, and I'd say we have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of influences, but if, if I had to pick the biggest ones, the most permeating, strongest ones at that time, I would say we took Aerosmith and Van Halen and Guns N' Roses, mixed it with a little bit of like dirty New York rock and a little bit of New York punk rock and made Spread Eagle. And they then people started calling that street metal. Yeah. Well, obviously, late 80s, you know, Appetite for Destruction had already come out. Oh, yeah. Um, there, there was a, um, a, a definitely rougher, edgier uh, look and sound, Biohazard. All, all these bands were uh, coming with a, a hard yeah, hitting. That was, that was later. Yeah. What was, um, what do you think it was that got you signed so quickly? Who, who was the manager and was it a, a showcase you guys played or what, what contributed to the fact that they offered you a deal when you'd only been together that long? Well, it's a long story. There's a lot of reasons. Um, but I think the main reason we got signed so quickly is because we were the hungriest band in the country we were absolutely on fire we were vicious we we were relentless we had a take no prisoners attitude that i would never seen in a band in my entire life um and uh, a condensed version is we booked we wrote about four or five songs we booked some shows in the region, not in New York City, but like Jersey, like outside of New York, because we wanted to play outside of New York City initially. Um, yeah. to get, like just some some experience with that particular group of people. Um, and we we booked those shows. We wrote like about five songs, and um, we our managers, Charlie Gambetta and Scott Calvert invited some of their friends in the industry to come see us rehearse in a little, maybe 12 by 12, 15 by 15 basement rehearsal space 
in Manhattan, New York City. And uh, we started getting surprising uh, comments like we, you know, this, we're interested in the band and we, we didn't expect any of that. We had these shows booked and, you know, I don't know what we expected, but uh, first couple of days we had people saying, you know, we want you to set up a private showcase for the whole label, et cetera. And then by the, like, then we, we were getting cold calls at the studio. Like we hear there's this fan spread Eagle, they're showcasing and we're like, we're just rehearsing, you know, but it started like, like a fire started burning. And then on the third or fourth day, MCA Universal came down and watched us play our five or six songs at that point and, uh, and said, we want to sign you tomorrow. So we were shocked. Um, I mean, we were ha very happy, obviously, but we did, we expected it. It was a, a path to getting a record deal. Um, but we didn't expect, you know, we expected to do, do shows and have then book the cat club or the limelight and have the labels come and do these showcases, you know, because Paul DiBartolo, Tommy Gallo and I have been chasing a record deal for like four and a half years. We were flying to New York or driving to New York, you know, showcasing at the cat club and people coming to Boston to see us. And we just, we did everything. We were making, you know, demos and videos, you know, our own videos, and just trying to get signed. And it was like impossible mountain to climb uh, because we didn't have the right band members yet. And so to, <laughs> to book some shows and do over a, a few rehearsals and get a, a, offered a record deal was just, it, our minds were blown. Um, and we, did sign with MCA because it was the, even though there were other labels saying we're interested and we want to start the process of how we could possibly sign this band, um, it was the one label that was saying we want you to sign tomorrow. And we figured with this experience we had of not being able to achieve this for so many years, we didn't know how solid or concrete this situation was um, or any of those situations were you know we had people say we want to sign you before and nothing ever come of it so we decided to take the leap of faith and go go with mca and mca was not a good fit for us it was not a good metal label but we didn't know that at the time and we also were in that mindset of we need to you know we're we're the we're the best we felt we're the best unsigned band in the country and we will overcome any obstacles that anyone else has and that was our attitude every day we were we were we rehearsed not just in spread eagle but in years prior when we lived in boston we rehearsed five or six times a week every week uh, and, you know, there'll be maybe a week where someone went away or something. We didn't, but, um, and we were out every night promoting the band in the clubs. And that was our work ethic uh, for many years. And that who, who was the, uh, who was your A&R guy and who was the president of MCA at that point? Our A&R guy was a guy named Bruce Dickinson. Okay. Uh, the guy not the singer of Iron Maiden, but the yeah, guy we know Bruce. Saturday, the guy in the Saturday Night Live skit with the cowboy. Right. <laughs> that was our A and R guy. Um, and the president, I'm not sure there was Al Teller, there was I'm not sure who the president was. Okay. Al Teller was one of the main guys. I, I know Irving guy. Azoff came in at one point. It wasn't Irving Azoff. But um so that's our that's that's the story of how how it began. Okay. And then Yeah, we, I know like at the time you're going to grab the brass ring, you know, whatever somebody's ready to cut a chat. Especially you know, they're, the they're ready to go. Of, of being in your 20s and you know the tr ha not being able to attain that, ob obtain that or attain that. Um 
we felt like we just got to get in the game already. Right. I mean, Universal, a prominent company. And, of course, in the past, they had bands like The Who and Leonard Skinner and Elton John, but those were bygone eras, you know. And Yeah, it was definitely a bygone era. Metal got huge with GNR and, and those other bands, and they wanted to get into the game. Yeah. In, in retrospect, a label like a, a Geffen or a Warner or Atlantic or, you know, Interscope, you know, may have been, you know, a better. Yeah, we, a had, better Sony. Home. we had Sony that not only they came down to one of those rehearsals and not yeah. only did they say they wanted to sign us, they kept saying for oh, not even, not even, like four years, we still want to sign the band. Um, so they were obviously very serious, but their process was, you know, that week when we, when we did those rehearsal showcases, um, they were going the next week to their company wide convention treat or whatever you call it, you yeah. know, like in their gathering, gathering in Texas or whatever it was. So we we're talking about setting up a showcase like three weeks away for the whole label. And here's MCA that says, we want to sign you tomorrow, you know? So that's what we were weighing, balancing. Like, you know, what if Ray gets a, a, a cold and, and loses his voice, you know, and, and we can't do the showcase or we do the showcase and someone, right. you know, someone breaks a string and, you know, and or, or vibe or momentum on stage or, or, or if you push mc away and it doesn't work out with another label they might not rekindle that was definitely at the top of our, our thought process you know like these things don't stick around forever you know they they could get their feelings hurt or you know so we did what we did and you know i'm talking to you about it right now 33 almost yeah, 30 34 years later, later. so the so the debut album came out in ninety and then opened to the public ninety three. What are you what are your best memories of making those records? What do you think you best achieved? And if you had to do it again, what would you have if any made it different? Well, I feel what we best achieved is we captured the live band and the energy we had of all those years of rehearsing. We captured it on tape uh, and we did record to two inch tape uh, back then and to, yeah, actually for many years we all know um and so and you know that experience of recording in times square you know in a city we lived in like a vi such a vibrant city it definitely translated uh, so i i don't see I don't have any regrets of that first album at all. You know, I look back on it, I, I listen to it, and it really comes through as, as the, the aggressive band that we were. Yeah, I know in recent years, uh, some polls have put it in the top 10 as some of the, the records of, of, of that era. And and who produced the debut? Charlie Gambetta, our, oh, okay. our two managers, and the other okay. manager directed our videos okay so you were self-contained you wrote the songs self-produced within your team and directed the videos yeah we were we were self-contained other than we needed the label to do their part and they did an okay job was it the same lineup on the second album or did the second you bring... album is things changed drastically okay uh, uh, i'd say that Beginning of things changing drastically is we 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 started to change our sound before our fans wanted us to change our sound. Um, we went in a slightly different direction than street metal um, that we were known for and that our fans wanted from us. And I'd say half the second album is that, and sec half the second album isn't. And then um, our guitar player f fired our drummer, and then our drummer came back, and you know, so everything was changing. Um, and then our drummer left again, you know, so um, you know, it was a very different record. 
Okay. It felt very different on every level. Was it still self-produced or did you bring in an outside producer? Still self-produced. And now Paul DiBartolo, our guitar player, who was very hands-on on the first album, also got proper co-producing credit with Charlie Gambetta on the second album. Okay. Yeah, I know it was a difficult era coming out in early 90s, you know, with... Um, uh, you know, yeah, with with Nirvana and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains dominating on MTV, did yeah. did you try to uh, essentially kind of um, meet in the middle of where you what you were doing and what was happening? I think it would be hard to not be influenced by you know some of that. It got so massive. Uh, it wasn't massive, massive when we started the process of the album, but the album took years to make. And by the end, by the end, by the time, you know, we were done with the songwriting, grunge was absolutely massive. Was Bruce Dickinson still at MCA at that point? Okay. And was he kind of advising you like, hey, guys, look at the uh, weather out here? No, he never, he, he was, he was a great A&R guy. He never told us to do anything except what we, what we felt. I think it was the band and management that were getting confused. So you did the um, um, the third record independently, talking about uh, getting the band back together and making that record. Well, Ray and I got the band back together in 2006, which is quite a while ago. Um, but to be honest, I was... You know, we were talking in earlier episodes about my my schedule, and I was just going from UFO tour to Bach tour to UFO back to Sebastian, you know, nonstop. That and you know, doing these really big shows, that it was hard to be fully invested in Spread Eagle again, um, because I, you know, I had a book it. I would have to book it. I wanted to book it around you know, my, my bigger gigs, um, you know, everyone has to work and be also doing well in the industry because of these bigger bands, that was all good stuff. So I did the best I could though, because Spread Eagle was very dear to me. Um, but we, you know, I was doing, so now I'm doing three bands at once. Uh, so we went to Europe in 2017 and started to make some noise because we were taking initiative to, to take some bigger you know, steps. And when we got back from Europe, Frontiers contacted me and made a record and uh, we're all very proud of it. We feel it totally stands up to our, our earlier work and our, our fans feel great about it and they actually got the best reviews of all three albums so and was this the first spread eagle record made digitally um or were you still using the analog studio we're still using analog studio okay yeah all three albums were recorded on on vintage neve consoles okay i know digital is so much easier to work with um and I know they're constantly trying to come up with plugins and programs that will give you the analog warmth and sound utilizing the digital domain. Well, uh, do you think they'll ever achieve that? No, no. Digital, digital is, is, is a recreation of sound. Um, you know, it's not, it's not recording sound, but it was to answer your question. It was the first, Spread Eagle album, we used Pro Tools uh, digital, you know, for editing and mixing. Right. So you took it from analog into the digital domain for editing. Yeah. Well, that's somewhat best of both worlds. You I get mean, that great drum sound, your bass and guitar sounds, the vocals. Yeah. And I know you have tour dates. I see uh, L.A., the whiskey a go go coming up. Uh, tell us 
what is the latest with spread eagle what's coming up i know there's new music being recorded where are we at um well we're we're always working we're always touring um and we will always keep touring because we took those years off and we don't want to do that again so what happened was uh, you know COVID hit of course and uh phil mogg had his heart procedure and sebastian stopped touring so i uh i had time to get this back up full on where i'm really spending a lot more time on it and the gigs are coming in so we're going to keep doing them uh as you mentioned we have vegas hollywood phoenix glendale in february newark delaware frenchtown new jersey Scram PA, Providence, Rhode Island, New York, New York, all in February. We go on the Monsters of Rock cruise, which is I've done in the, my other bands, but Spread Eagle has never done. So that's going to be an absolute blast. That's which amazing. which bands on that cruise are you most looking forward to seeing or hanging with? Uh, Glenn Hughes, KK's Priest. Um, Oh man, I'd have to see the list. Right, I know Ace Freely's on that, I believe, and others. Yeah, now Glenn Hughes is absolutely amazing yes. for his age and what he's gone through and yeah. come out the other side. Glenn has Queens Rike are always great live. Yeah, um, you know, it'd be cool to see British Lion. Yeah, Steve I'm Harris. I'm insane are amazing. Oh yeah. I just spoke to uh, John Bush. Enough's enough. I I love their music. I yep. like Dangerous Toys. Uh, you know, there's so many great bands. So many. Joe Satriani. I know my guitar player Johnny will be very excited to see them. It'd be cool to see what what the Darkness are all about live. I've never seen that. Yeah. And you know, and many more. Too many to name. And, and what can you say about a Glenn Hughes who's goes all the way back to the early 70s, you know, with that Burn album with David Coverdale coming out, scorching the California jam and 300,000 people and, and all that. And, you know, being a survivor and really coming out the other side with his health and, uh, you know, a vigor. Glenn, yeah. Glenn looks absolutely amazing for his age. He is amazing. He play you know he's a perfect example of what i was saying some of these bands understandably can't do what they did when they were younger he's just a guy who was incredibly talented and also lucky that his voice is still there of what he had when he was a kid you know and he plays bass and totally riffs at the same time like he's so talented he's so just god-given talent so I've seen him before, and, and you can never see Glenn Hughes too much. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. That's... I'm looking forward to my, my, my band's reaction to being in a situation like this. You know, <laughs> they're gonna, they don't know what, what they're out in for. You know? Yeah, that's a lot of talent on, on, on a boat. You can't and... escape the music everywhere you go on the boat. There's right. just bands playing. It's just so much. And, and I've been on a lot of cruises in, in America and overseas, to, you know, a lot of rock cruises I played, and this is the best lineup of any cruise I've ever seen in my entire life, by far. I mean, it's just sick. Uh, monsters. Yeah, I guess you know, if you sell out the boat, you can have the budget to bring on some really great bands. So it's a win-win for everybody. Well, I think it's been sold out before. I could be wrong, but I think it's been sold out before, and they've never had this level of bands. Yeah, it seems seems oh, to we're doing the right thing. Seems Most to draw time. more more and more people. And 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 what are you thinking uh, as far as the release of new music? What what are you hoping for? I'm hoping for next year. You know, we're always working on new music. We got about eight demos we're kicking around, and uh, I work on it every day. So yeah, I'm planning on the next 2024. Year. Hopefully, new music. Yeah. Okay. And that would still be with Frontiers? Um, we we have to see. Okay. Know? We have to see all that stuff. I'm I'm not even beginning to think about that stuff. 
Okay. Well, we look forward to seeing you certainly here on the Sunset Strip. Uh, you know, Stephen Piercy of Rat is uh, performing there tonight. Uh, Dexter Pussycat, L.A. Guns, um, all sorts of uh, bands have been uh, packing, packing the whiskey. And even though the Sunset Strip isn't what it was maybe in the heyday in the 80s, it's still uh, a vital area between the whiskey and the rainbow, keeping keeping rock alive and just a legacy playing in a club that Led Zeppelin and Alice Cooper and ACDC and Judas Priest and everybody has played Van Halen and Motley Crue. Everybody has played that stage over the years. Yeah. That the strip will always be important no matter if it's on an up swing or a downswing. It's always, you know, it's a, it's a one, one of a kind place. Well, what can you tell, what can you tell Southern California um, that you have in store for them and the reason why they should not miss that show? Well, we are 100% live, no backing tracks ever in the past or in the future. And uh, real live rock is something that's disappearing in this world. Um, among us musicians and industry types, we know that many, many, many bands are not live. And because of that, a new form of music, live music, live music has entered the scene where bands are basically lip syncing to their albums. And that's not what we do. Uh, what we do is what the way it's been done forever, but that's a dying breed. So it's important to come out and support these bands that do it for real and do it well, still do it well. So, um, you know, we're just a great hard rock band and we're all four of us sing. And we also have Every Mother's Nightmare supporting us who are a cool band from back in the era. Yeah. So it's, it's a great night to come out. February 2nd, nope, February 3rd in Hollywood at the Whiskey. Well, we'll certainly spread the word. Our special guest has been the one and only Rob DeLuca. You know him, you love him. And and come on down. It's going to be a party on the Sunset Strip. And uh, let's relive some of the great memories and hear some of that new music. Rob, always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll definitely be uh, waiting for you on Sunset. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate it.